I'm an addict and my name is Usman. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to please kindly just simply turn to someone close to you and give them a nice, big, heartfelt hug. Once again, I'm an addict and my name is Usman. And thank you for hugging somebody. In our literature, listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna make repeated references to our literature because it fits me to the T. I'm gonna re be referring to my autobiography, otherwise known as the basic text. <laughs> and sometimes I'm gonna to refer to my sequel, more about Usman, otherwise known as It Works How and Why. <laughs> but in our, in our basic text, it states that recovery becomes a contact, pro contact process wherein we lose the fear of touching and of being touched. We learn that a simple loving hug can make all the difference in the world. When we feel alone, we experience real love and real friendship. So that hug was very important. Even with this many of us assembled, you can bet that there's someone amongst us who was in desperate, dire need of a hug. We all emanate from the never let them see a sweat school of life. <laughs> so you just can't tell looking at somebody's exterior whether they're doing all right, you know? It takes a while before we can learn other language than how you doing, I'm all right, I'm fine. I'm fine, so we can get down to the real feelings, you know, so it could be that somebody was sitting right next to you that was in desperate, dire need of a hug, you know. Also, I was taught when I first came around that humility is a vital part of this recovery process, just as important as food and water are to nourishment. And humility was described and defined for me as not me thinking less of myself, but thinking of myself less. So thank you for giving somebody a hug. I need to thank, secondly, God for being so compassionate, so merciful, so loving, and so beneficent to allow me to come all the way to London, England to keep what I have by giving it away. I want to thank the convention committee, you know, a little while ago, I met two delightful ladies, Kareen and, 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 and Anne Marie. They came to the United States and, uh, and they were provided with a tape by my good friend Vernon 27X. And uh, as a result of that, here I stand. And, and I'm real grateful for that. You know, I've been to London before, but this is the first time I've been to London clean. I could really appreciate your fine country. You see? And so I'm real grateful. The next thing I want to do is I want to extend some thanks and gratitude to every single person that had anything whatsoever to do with putting this convention on. It takes a lot of work to put on a convention. That's why they sometimes refer to it as thankless service work. Because when those people are putting the convention together, it sometimes seems like they're not appreciated, you know? People join in, then drop out, and the show still must go on. So right about now, I'd like you all to join me in just expressing some appreciation to everybody who put this together.
Thank you. And now, I thoroughly intend to enjoy myself. I was talking to Lucia about a lady who spoke here in London before, Dot T. She used to be my grand sponsor. And she had an expression. She said, she said that recovery is just like sex. If you're not enjoying yourself, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so, so I thoroughly intend to enjoy myself and, and, and for that reason I need to I need to give you my disclaimer. You know, um, um, you know when my wife shared yesterday, you know, she, uh, she, she, she reminds me of uh, our literature on page 119 in the works how and why where it talks about how we each have a one of a kind personality sure to be an attraction to many. We have different styles of expression and my wife when she speaks, she's like a, like a raw, exposed nerve, you know. You can just, you're right there. She just brings you right with her, and you feel, you emote along with her. You know what I'm saying? When she cries, you, you want to cry, right? And she has that ability to be honest like that, you know. And some of us are funny and humorous, right? And some of us tell the truth like no one else can. And then it's, it goes on to say, and some of us have the ability to share in no uncertain terms. And so sometimes I curse, right? Sometimes I curse. It's just like, again, when you're having sex, you know, you might say, oh God. <laughs> and then in the next sentence, say, God damn. <laughs> right? And you, you really wouldn't want somebody to interrupt you in the throes of passion to point out to you that, you know, those two don't quite go together. Oh, God, God damn, you know. But it's the same way when you share. You know, I don't have time to edit myself up here. I don't have time to censor myself up here. So don't leave here. And if somebody asks you, how was, how was the Sunday morning speaker, don't say, you know, rarely have I heard such a beautiful exposition of the vagaries of addiction <laughs> with particular emphasis on the Narcotics Anonymous modality of recovery <laughs> except for an apparent inability on behalf of the speaker to avoid the propensity to, pro to prolifically profanate his English. just that when I go, I go, all right? And I'm getting ready to go now, so just come on with me, all right? Follow the concepts. Don't get lost on the technical jargon and all of that good stuff, you know. I'm here to talk about stepping on up. Stepping on up. It's taken me a long time to step on up. I've been a stepson, a stepbrother, a stepfather. I've stepped in and stepped out. But it's taken me a long time to step on up. All right? And the reason why it took me so long to step on up is because I really didn't know how. I'm going to tell you my story, and when you listen to my story, you're listening to a story of a man who really, truly didn't know how to step up in life. I had a lot of misinformation that I got from other misinformed people, so I didn't know how to step up, you know? I was an individual who was described in the beginning of our basic text where they say I was trapped in the grip of a hopeless dilemma. Now, a regular dilemma is bad enough. <laughs> because a, a dilemma means no matter what you do, you're gonna get the same outcome. But they go further and they say, I was trapped in a hopeless dilemma. The solution to which was spiritual in nature. And that's the key. My solutions were never 
spiritual in nature. And that's why I couldn't step up. In the 11th step, in the basic text, it says, our spiritual condition is the basis for a successful recovery that offers unlimited growth. Again, our spiritual condition is the basis for a successful recovery that offers unlimited growth. And similar language is found in step 12 in the works on why, where it says, we saw that by making our spiritual development our primary focus, other aspects of our lives would develop naturally as they were meant to all along. So I didn't have a natural development. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. I can remember when I was near the end of my road going to my dear departed mother to borrow some money so I could get high. And mothers are a funny breed because mothers can say more with a look. You know, sometimes you can go to somebody and ask them for something and the cure is worse than the sickness. In other words, I would go to my mother and I would tell her, you know, I need to borrow a little money. You know you'll get it back. And that wasn't the issue. And she would lend it to me. But she would always give me something to go with. She'd give me the money. And then she would proceed to start shaking her head and making noises like, mm, mm, mm. And then towards the end, she used to just say, you know, I'll just be so glad when you grow up. I will, I'll just be so glad if I could just live to see you grow up. And it used to throw me off because I was a fully formed, fully grown man in my, you understand? She had grandchildren through me, so she wasn't talking about physically. I had received the finest of education. I had a first-rate education. So she wasn't talking about mentally. And I, I couldn't figure, what are you talking about? You just loaned me $20. What do you mean you'll be glad when I'm grown? What are you waiting for? I'm already grown. But what I didn't understand was that she was talking about growing up spiritually. She meant I'd be so glad when you will grow up spiritually. I'll be so glad when your spiritual condition is your primary focus. I'll be so glad when you grow up to be the man that God designed you to be. I'll be so glad. And now I can look back and understand what she was talking about. Because you see, I remember, I remember a time when I was just like God intended me to be. I remember being a little boy and just being happy, just happy, joyous, and free. Do you remember when you were small and you were just outright happy? I'm talking happy for no particular reason kind of happy. Just happy. Happy, happy, happy. Just a happy little boy. Whether you had toys or didn't have toys, you're just happy. Whether you had friends, you'd make up some imaginary friends. So who are you talking to? That's my friend. And they have a name for him and everything. It's my imaginary friend. His name's Bob. And you wind up speaking to Bob. Hi, Bob. You don't see Bob, but the kid is just happy needing no outside permission to be happy. I'm talking before you even know you're black, before you know you're white, before you know differences, before you know about being fat, before you know about being skinny, before you even know if you're poor, before the comparison sets in to where you're just flat out plain happy. You're just like the kid in Stevie Wonder's song where he says, listen to the children's laughter remind you of how it used to be. 
Would a child's heart go face the worry of the day? Happy. And I wonder, where did it all change? Think to yourself, where did it change for me? Where did it change for you? What happened? What happened to me to where down the road I could turn into Joe Pincushion? to happen before down the road you turn into Barry back and forth. <laughs> All night long. Excuse me everybody, I'm sorry to interrupt. We've just got a couple of toddlers who have lost their parents. Excuse me. There's a child called River. Uh, we think the parent is Catherine Fox and a child and the parent is Robert. Uh, is there anyone in this room who needs to go to the crèche to pick up their toddlers? Okay. And what has to happen before you become Wanda Hostro? I mean, when you grew up with morals, when you grew up with values, where did it all turn? What has to happen for us to become the people, you know, that we become, right? And I've wondered very often, where, 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 where did it all change? What had to happen? Because I'm one of these people who can identify his disease long before the substance came. I was a few flapjacks short of a full stack as a little tyke. I was a few french fries short of a Happy Meal. way back in the beginning. I remember at an early age going from that happy little boy I described to not liking the hand I had been dealt. Learning about differences. Learning about feeling less than. All of these things. To a point where as a youngster I recall wishing that I lived up the street. I didn't even want to really be a member of my own household. I wanted to be a member of the Miller household. Up the street, there was Mr. Miller, Billy Miller, his sister Gloria, and Mrs. Miller. And they had the perfect little household. And I used to just love spending endless hours in my mind. I lived up the street. And I remember I'd play with Billy Miller and Mrs. Miller say, Little Usman, are you hungry? And I'd say, hell yes, Mrs. Miller. And she said, well, what would you like? Bologna and cheese, tuna fish. What kind of sandwich would you like? And I'd say, get out of town. I remember running home and telling my mother, I said, Mom, Mom, guess what they have up, up the street at the Miller household? And she said, what? I said, choices. <laughs> And she said, oh, don't act like you don't have choices here. <laughs> you know, good and well, you can, eat, you can have peanut butter and jelly, or if you don't like that, you can have jelly with your peanut butter. <laughs> but we're not talking ordinary peanut butter. We're talking about this industrial strength size <laughs> peanut butter that came in a big silver tub. Looked like an oil tank, you know? It was just a great big giant tub of hard ass peanut butter that had like this oil slick on top. Just hard. It was so hard you used to have to jump start it. Ch churn it. You had to churn it to get it to some sort of spreadable consistency. Non-discriminating peanut butter. Didn't care whether you used whole wheat, white, rye, pumpernickel, Italian. Guaranteed to fuck your sandwich up. And you would wind up with like this little peanut butter jelly ball. You mushed it together. And I could remember my mother today saying things like, oh, just eat it. It's all going to the same place. Just eat it. Just eat it. <laughs> and 
And I remember in my household when we got matching furniture. I remember. And no sooner than the furniture came in, my mother promptly proceeded to zip lock everything. This is important because no one's natural ass ever touched the fabric. That's important. Because see, I told you I got misinformation. Listen to the thinking in the household. Loving things and using people. These things are more important than you. If I come home from work and there's anything wrong with this fabric, there'll be hell to pay. We got carpeting and then this, immediately this big long plastic runner shot through the house. That's where I first learned to stay on the path. <laughs> These things are important because early in life man makes habits and then later on the habits make the man. I told you I was the recipient of misinformation for misinformed people. So the thinking was off. Thinking determines your action. Your thoughts determine your actions, right? Your thoughts determine your choices. Your choices determine your actions. Your actions create your habits, and your habits determine your character, and your character influences your destiny. So I can see way back then what was going on, you know? So I wanted out. I told you I picked up comparison early on, and right after that I remember picking up fantasy. I remember watching cartoons for endless hours. I don't know if you got the same ones we got, but I'll tell you what I watched. And I already told you I was a few french fries short of a happy meal. So when I watched the cartoons, I saw what was going on in my world. So when I watched Goldilocks and the Three Bears, I saw a B and E. Goldilocks broke into the bear family's home. They didn't invite her little happy ass up in there. She broke in. And like a little good addict, she made some hot porridge and then some cold porridge. And then she concocted like this porridge speedball and went upstairs and nodded out. <laughs> Snow White was a little skeezer on a holstro <laughs> with seven little tricks. And she worked all of them. Yogi Bear was a ripoff artist. With his, along with his co-conspirator, Boo Boo. <laughs> he saw something, he just took it. <laughs> Listen to the messages I'm getting. You want love? Get with Lottie Dottie anybody, like Snow White did. You see something you want, just take it. You want to get in the house, nobody home, just break in. Wile E. Coyote gave new meaning to the second step. He used to make the same mistake expecting a different result. But my favorite of all was Popeye. I love Popeye. I really did love Popeye. Maybe because he had those big attic arms or something, I don't quite know. But I really related to him. He wasn't a superhero or anything. Matter of fact, for most of the cartoon, he caught pure hell. He caught pure hell, but I think he was an addict. Because after a while, he'd surrender. And he'd let you know when he was getting ready to go into surrender mode, he said, that's all I can stand. I, I can't stand no more. <laughs> and I'm watching. And then after he reaches that point, he'd reach into his stash. And, <laughs> and he'd pull out this green leafy vegetative substance. And he'd squeeze the can and it would shoot up in an arc. Now think back, and he'd promptly proceed to smoke it in his pipe. <laughs> and then he'd change. I'm watching this. I'm watching this. I'm watching this. I'm noticing he's changed now. He's not catching hell anymore. And all of a sudden, he's standing up. He's got self-acceptance. He said, I am what, yeah. He's got self-acceptance. He says, I am what I am, goddammit. I'm, I'm Popeye. Yeah. 
right? He ain't taking no more ass kickings and none of that, you know? And all of a sudden he's smooth, now he can talk to little skinny olive oil, right? Huh? He just turned on and said, well, blow me down. So I'm watching this and I'm getting the message. Look, if, you, if, if things get a little bit too much, find something that you can put in you so that you can be all right. This is the messages I'm getting and I'm paying attention. So it's no small wonder that later on I try to emulate the same behavior. Lying, cheating, stealing, breaking in, you know, getting with Lottie, Dottie and anybody. And when it got real rough, find me something that I could smoke. You know, find me something that I could smoke right because see early in the game i was addicted to certainty when you don't like the hand you've been dealt you get addicted to certainty and that's what i got addicted to certainty i wanted to be sure of how i was going to feel on a daily basis you see and then I, if i couldn't touch it smoke it shoot it sex it drive it wear it i wasn't down i wanted mine and my language even sounded like that. What kind of change back am I going to get out of this? If you ask me to do something, I said, why? What's in it for me? Right? Because I'm transforming. I'm transforming into a full-blown addict. Now, that's not to say I wasn't trying to do things and have a normal life. You know, I'm reminded of the books, Sybil and Three Faces of Ease, which they had female protagonists, but the books were about, and we see in recovery, we can identify beyond race and gender and all of that, you know? And I identified with these these lead characters in these books because what happened was they'd go out of the house on Monday and then the next thing they know it would be Thursday and they'd be turning to their side and saying things like who are you and what did we just do and why are we here and where is my money and all of these things you see and this is what began to happen to me I was trying to the best of my ability to be a father man and an educated man and a professional man and a spiritual man and all of these different roles but in the meantime in between time this other individual had been created in me that I refer to as attic man attic man was was a bad somebody he could jump over abandoniums in a single bound he was a rough customer right and he began to interrupt my life First, he was like little attic boy. So we were all right, you know? He kind of came out on the weekends. I was like what you would consider a weekend warrior, all right? And, and if you, you said anything to me about it, I'll quickly correct you and let you know and know in certain terms, listen, this is my money, I worked for it. If I want to do a little something on the weekend, that's my business, it's my prerogative. Get some business in mind then. Because I was all right with being this weekend warrior. Attic boy and I used to just hang out until he started growing up. I could tell he was growing up because he began to sass me. He'd jump out. I said, wait a minute, it's Tuesday. He said, fuck that. <laughs> we ain't into that no more. I'm coming out whenever I get ready from now on. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, doesn't make any difference. And I began to lose my mind even more so. I began to do things like walk down the street talking to myself. People would be looking at me wondering what's wrong. I'd be holding entire conversations with myself. Like conversations like, I'm not gonna do it, not this paycheck, no, no. I'm gonna, because I believed in things like sheer willpower. I believed in things like gritty determination. I was out of my mind, I believed in ghosts and goblins, things like just one. I know none of you ever believed in just one <laughs> or a little bit, but if you're a full tilt boogie variety addict, there's no such thing as just one. And I didn't have, you see at this point I was undiagnosed. I didn't have anybody to tell me, listen, if you find yourself laying on the railroad tracks, and you hear the train whistle, it's not warning you about the caboose. It's trying to alert you to get out of the way of the first car. The engine is the one that's gonna bust your ass. 
And so it was with me. I didn't have a clue. I was undiagnosed. See, we have a disease that's progressive, incurable, and fatal. Cunning, baffling, and insidious. But even worse than that, it defies detection, diagnosis, and treatment. In other words, I could never see myself coming. By the time I realized that I had met the enemy and the enemy was me, once again I'd be sitting on the side of the bed, totally busted, dusted, and thoroughly disgusted. <laughs> Having to respond to questions from family members about, why did you do it again? And the only thing I could come up with would be, I don't know. I don't know. They said, do you think you're going to do it again? I don't know. <laughs> do you believe you'll ever stop? I really don't know. Because I didn't know. That was the most honest thing I could say. I didn't know. I was insane. I was out of my mind. I was playing games like... I used to play this game called hiding my money from me. Did you hear what I said? I'm the same person hiding the money from himself who thinks that he's not going to find the money that he just hid. And I have brilliant devices, which consisted of, I'd get a stack of envelopes, and I'd segregate my money. And I'd put some money in an envelope and, check this out, seal it up. <laughs> seal it up. Take a big, bold magic mark and write rent in big, bold letters. Underline exclamation point. Subtitle, most important. Take some more money, food. Yes, sir. Telephone, gas and electric, all the way down to miscellaneous. <laughs> Attic man, jump out, say you better open up one of them. I don't care which one it is, but either you're going to open up one or we'll open up every one of them all night long. <laughs> but I knew my disease knew. Because my disease talks to me in my own voice. So when's the last time you used Usman? I said, oh, it's been about three, four days. And my disease would say, and they said you couldn't stop. Personally, I always had confidence in you. <laughs> and since it's now quite apparent that you can stop when you want to stop, <laughs> let's go get one. <laughs> I'm telling you folks, I tried everything. I told you I've been to Europe before. I remember, I remember thinking in terms of geographicals. I didn't know that I took me wherever I went. So I thought that if I just changed playgrounds and playmates and play things, things would be different. I was kind of like the man who every time he got on the merry-go-round would wind up dizzy and would get off talking about, whoo, watch out for that red horse. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't get on that red horse. You can wind up dizzy. So I remember coming over here and I came to London, I can't tell you anything about it, went from here to France, I went to France, going to go see Mona Lisa and the Louvre and all of that Eiffel Tower, and, and they had a little itinerary hooked up, and, and you know the French are funny people, they drink wine with everything. You order a bowl of cereal, they want to know what kind of wine would you like with cereal. <laughs> so at this point, I don't know that alcohol is a drug, one is wet, another is dry, bottom line, you both, they both get you high, right? So by the time it's time for the tour, I'm drunk. And the tour went one way and Attic Man jumped out. <laughs> Speaking French. <laughs> yeah, the tour went one way and Attic Man jumped out, he said, Bonjour, mademoiselle. Comment ça va? Ça va bien? Où se trouve un petit peu de heroin? Monsieur, monsieur, un instant, s'il vous plaît, ne bouge pas. Avez-vous un petit peu de cocaine? 
go on, go on. And I know all about making the same mistakes, expecting a different result, because I remember getting back to the United States, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I was watching my TVs, because I had two TVs. <laughs> one with picture and no sound, and one with sound and no picture. <laughs> kind of look at them both. And you can watch TV like that, you know what I mean? With the little coat hangers and everything. So I'm watching my TVs and this commercial comes on, it says, come down to Jamaica, where we'll love you. Come down to Jamaica where the water is blue. I said, that's it, we're going to Jamaica. I'm gonna kick on the beach, kick this habit on the beach. Got down to Jamaica. I remember coming out of the cabana and I remember my wife had these two pina coladas there. And I said, wait a minute, don't you remember Europe? She said, but, and they had these little parasols and cherries in them. And she said, but look at them, they're adorable. <laughs> they're so adorable. What can they hurt? We're way down here in Jamaica, and they're adorable. I said, they are kind of cute, aren't they? <laughs> Forgetting that in Jamaica, the same rum they use in their pina coladas is that 151 jet fuel. <laughs> and so when I sucked back one of those pina coladas, attic man jumped out, he said, yes, man! <laughs> he said, yes, man, must be a real Irish now, boy. <laughs> huh? Thought you were true with me, huh? No, boy. Now move your mumma clot to us and get me a nice big fat Jamaican split right now. Social acceptability didn't work. No, because see, my, my, my addiction ran the gamut. Does it, this disease doesn't care whether you're from Park Avenue or the Park Bench. It will break you down, you know? And sometimes we need to share for the newer members because everybody doesn't come in here strumming and bumming. Some people come in here having experienced that special kind of hell. I'm talking about that special hell where they wasn't struggling for another hit. That wasn't their problem. They had plenty of money and plenty of drugs. They just had no breaks. That's a horrible feeling. When you know if you take another hit, you're going to die and you got plenty of drugs and plenty of money, and you know you're gonna take another hit. That's a horrible feeling. It's a real horrible feeling, you know. And so I identify with having tried the social acceptability tip. I remember having a little Cadillac, and I thought that because I could drive up to the drive-up teller, and because I had on a shirt and tie, and I had a shake case, that made me unique. I didn't learn how to take off my uniqueers until I came in here. And I remember driving up to the drive-up teller and saying, hello, how are you? And she said, well, hello, Mr. Professional Man. How are you today? And I said, fine, fine, thank you very much. You're new here, aren't you? You better get to know me. I'm here all the time. She said, would that be the full extent of your withdrawal? I said, I'll do quite nicely. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. I drive away. A little while later, I'd be back. She says, oh, we're back, are we? Yes, yes, we're back, we're back. Ray Charles could see we're back. <laughs> Some unforeseen contingencies arose that are going to require my immediate attention. You better give me three, five, no, make that ten times as much money. We have to get down to the bottom of this. And I'd burn rubber getting away. <laughs> now listen to the progression. With ten times as much money, I'd now be back in one-tenth the time. The only thing now is my tie's all crooked. I got my high beams on, and my jaw seems to have a life of its own. She says, oh, we're back again, are we? Is there anything, is there anything else we can do for you? I said, yes, yes, just lean over here, lean over here. I want you to hear every word of this. Just, what you can just do your motherfucking job. Don't be acting like you care about how you're having a nice day. You're not having a nice day with your friendly ass. Just get my money. Because Attic Man has taken over. You understand? Interrupt my whole life. 
I remember fashioning myself a little bit of a Rudolph Vaselino in my day, you know? And all it was was, like, like, like Vernon 27X shared about earlier, I'd just have a little drugs and some money. It wasn't that I had this silver tongue or anything, this smooth rap. You know, but I remember, you know, getting the drugs and the money and the girl and going to the little shady rest and, 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 and she said, are we ready to get busy? I said, wait a minute, just go freshen up or something. I'm going to just do a little something and it would be all right. Just go ahead and busy yourself for a minute. I just have to do a little something here. And, and I proceed to get on and, and she'd come out. She said, I'm ready now, daddy. But see, I would be gone and Attic Man would be there now because I got high. And he said, well, you might as well suit the fuck up. <laughs> Ain't nothing happening in here. I don't know why we brought your broke ass here in the first place. You don't have no drugs. You better take a hit of this before I change my mind. So you can see my whole life and being was centered around the getting and using and finding ways and means to get more. I'm going to hit the fast forward button here because that's enough identification for you. You can pretty much appreciate that I am you and you are me, right? And the whole thing about it was at the end, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. I'm not here glorifying my using. I'm not here glorifying my addiction. Because in the end, I was greasier than a filling station mop. I was toe up from the floor. I was hit. I was hurt. I was beaten. I was whipped. I was waxed and polished. I was done. When I got here, I was done, right? And I remember trying to get into treatment, begging to get into treatment, telling the person on the other end, if you don't come and get me, I just don't know what's going to happen. And he said, well, maybe by tomorrow or the next day we'll have a bed. No, no, that's too long. God only knows where I'll be tomorrow or the next day. I probably won't even have the change to call you on the phone because my life had been reduced to that level. Eating little twin packs of donuts, calling it a full meal with a little colored water for a balanced meal. A meal consisting of a bag of potato chips. And if it was a holiday, barbecue chips. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Really in bad shape. And I remember arguing with this, you have to come get me now. And the person on the other end said, okay, we're gonna come. And I said, because if you don't, what'd you say? They said, we're gonna come get you right now. I said, you mean as in right now, right now? <laughs> Say, yes, we're going to come get you right now. We hear your plea. I said, well, let me get you. I mean, you're going to give a guy a chance to tie up his loose ends, right? <laughs> to put my affairs in order. I had no affairs to be put in order. I was out of order. You see? And the only thing I want to say about treatment is, you know, I remember that so, so well, you know. Here you are today, begging for help you needed yesterday, but you really don't want it to come till tomorrow. That's insane. That's insane. But I remember being in treatment, and, 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 and the thing about it, the best thing that happened to me in treatment was that H&I came, man. Thank God for H&I. <laughs> And if there's anybody in here wondering if you can get this thing, if I can do it, you can do it. Really, truly, you can. You know, because I was a piece of work. I was a piece of work, you know. I thank God that H&I came and H&I introduced me to Narcotics Anonymous. You know, because those are two most important things to save my life. Almighty God and Narcotics Anonymous really, truly saved my life. And I was a piece of work. You know, I remember getting here and I just had so many questions. I, I just wanted to disqualify myself. I didn't know about identifying and not comparing. I didn't know, you know, and, 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 I, and I thought that the people back at the spot missed me, you know? And, I, and I'd say, well, I gotta go back and get my brother. And then, you know, I gotta go back and get this one and that one. They need to hear this message too. And the people, they didn't mince words with me. They said, listen, you must avoid people, places and things. Because in order to get fucked, first you got to get in position. <laughs> and excuse me for being so graphic, but that's how it was told to me. In order to get fucked, first you got to get in position. I said, damn. 
I said, well, that sounds good, but how, I, I don't, how do I, how do I, how do I avoid people, places, and things are all around me. I used everywhere. And they said, well, it's hard to thread a moving needle. If you keep moving, that's why we suggest 90 meetings in 90 days. Train your feet. Develop some recovering feet. Make your feet get in the habit of going to the meetings. Learn to act your way into a better way of thinking instead of thinking your way into a better way of acting. Get beyond the two main tools of your disease, your thinking and your feeling. Why would you want to rely on the same two main tools of your disease? That's a sucker bet, you know? Why would you want to just keep buying your own commercial? Because I thought that, you know, if I was trying to do this recovery thing, but if I got this news bulletin, a word from your disease, we want to use right about now. <laughs> you don't substance, you know? I had to get a sponsor. I had to have somebody who would stay on me. Because in my mind, well, it's raining. I was going to make a meeting. But you see, it's raining. Aren't you the same person who used to walk from one side of town to the other in the driving rain just because you knew when so-and-so got paid and you hoped that if you, if you stood on his doorstep that they'd open the door and see you with your drenched behind and take pity on you and possibly might break you off a little something-something. And now you're worried about the weather? Well, I was going to go, but nobody's going to come and pick me up. You didn't worry about transportation before, how you were going to get home, or anything like that. So be for real with yourself, Usman. Don't play, don't be willing to put less energy into your recovery than you would put into your addiction. You know that when you were using, you didn't play these excuses. Didn't matter what you had on. You didn't have to freshen up. All you need was a phone call and you were ready to go. So be ready to recover at the drop of a hat as well. You know, and I needed to hear these things. I needed to know that there was a way to get beyond guilt, shame, remorse, and all that embarrassing feelings that I had. That's why it's such a beautiful thing to know that you're an addict. Being an addict is not a sentence, it's a diagnosis. It's a wonderful thing to know that you're an addict. It's a wonderful thing to finally understand what's been going on with you all your life. It's a wonderful thing to know that you have a disease and not a moral deficiency. Because the wider world would have you believe that there's something morally wrong with you. And that's important. I was talking to my friend Merrick the other night and we were talking about that and how, you know, it's important for the newer member to realize, you know, that uh, it's important to distinguish your disease from your recovery. Because like it says in recovery and relapse, many of us had difficulty coming into the fellowship because we did not understand that we have the disease of addiction. We sometimes see our past behavior as part of ourselves and not part of our disease. So you find people talking about in recovery, in recovery, oh, I'm just a liar. I'm a hoe. I'm a thief. I'm this, I'm that. Describing the behavior of the disease as if it's you. Internalizing that and then wondering why you want to use. There's a big distinction between what you did when you had to use and who you really are. We're spiritual beings going through a human experience. That's our true nature, our divine nature. And if you're not careful, you'll label yourself with the behavior of your disease. And that's a very dangerous thing. So I kept coming, I kept coming. I got a home group where people knew my face so that even if I didn't share, they could look at me and tell me whether something was going wrong. So if I wasn't being forthright and they said, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. You doing all right? Yes, I'm fine, thanks. I'm fine. They said, no, you're not. You're not fine. And you need to talk about it because nobody can read a closed book. You know? I said, well, I don't know how, how long I can, how long I have to keep this up? And he said, for the foreseeable future. This is a journey, not a destination. 
You're never going to reach a point where you're recovered up with the EG on the end. You're never going to re reach a point where you no longer fit the literature. You're never going to reach a point where you are power greater than yourself. It's the process of coming back that restores us to sanity. It's like breathing. No matter how much I breathe yesterday, it's advisable for me to take a few gulps of air today. <laughs> it's the process of breathing that we equate with life. So anyway, they introduced me to these steps. Now we're talking about really stepping on up now. Because the steps are our solution, our survival kit. The steps of Narcotics Anonymous are second to none. And we need to be really, really clear about that. Narcotics Anonymous has a first step that's unequaled anywhere. Because we have a first step that allows us to engage in one-stop shopping. Whatever rocks your boat, you can come in here and get better with. Because our first step deals with the disease of addiction. Addiction is a pathological or sick relationship to any mind or mood altering experience with life damaging consequences. So you can fill in your own blanks. You don't say, well, I don't have a problem with drinking anymore. Well, then you don't have to worry about that too much. But there may be other things you need to take a look at. You understand? You have to fill in your own blanks and recognize that we need something to get down to the root of what's going on with us. If you see a man with a cold and his nose is running, it's nice to give him some Kleenex. But if you really want to help, you need to give him something that's going to get down to the cold itself. That's going to give him a chance at not having a cold. Don't keep throwing boxes of Kleenex at him. How long is he going to blow his nose? How long are you going to talk about just the most obvious symptom of the disease? Well, I haven't used a drug in X amount of years. Big deal. You're still crazy as a jaybird. <laughs> so anyway, I needed, I needed to come in here and grab hold of this first step so that I could get in touch with all the obstacles in my way of my spiritual journey. One of the reasons why I didn't have a shot, I was in the grip of a hopeless dilemma, was because all of my solutions were material in nature. If I just move here, it'll be all right. If I just change lovers, it'll be all right. If I just had more money, it'll be all right. I know I need a new car. I know I need a complete new wardrobe. I know I need a new car, new wardrobe, and a new lover. Always working on the material and the exterior. Never realizing that I keep making the same mistake. You know, addicts only make one mistake. It comes in many guises, but it's the same mistake. And it's the mistake of misplacing our faith. That's what we do. We misplace our faith. And then wonder what happened. Put down the substance and get in a silly relationship and wonder what happened. You know, misplaced our faith, you know. Put down the substance, but then buy into money, property, and prestige, social acceptability, misplaced our faith. You can be in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous thinking that you're living by the grace of God, and in reality, you're living by the grace of your disease. You can be in Narcotics Anonymous thinking you're living by the grace of God, and you're living by the grace of your disease. I remember I had an uncle named Uncle Joe. He used to love fishing. God bless him. He used to always take me fishing. And we'd go in the middle of the night, early in the morning, in a little rickety boat. I'd be scared shitless. Come on, boy, we're going fishing. And to make matters even worse, once we got in the boat, he would promptly proceed to go to sleep. I say, ain't this a bitch? I don't even like fishing. I'm in the boat, it's dark, he's asleep. And even when we got a nibble and I thought he should be excited, and I said, Uncle Joe, look, look, I think we got a bite, we got a nibble. He must wake up and say something like, give it some line, boy, give it some line. And I'd really be confused. I thought the idea was to get the fish out of the water into the boat. 
He said, give it some lines, son, just give it some lines. See, because what he knew that I didn't appreciate was that even though the fish thought with the extra line that he was good to go because he could still flip and flop and jump up and out of the water and that he was still running something, Uncle Joe knew what the fish knew not. And what Uncle Joe knew was that the fish thought he was still living by the grace of the fish god, but he was really living by the grace of Uncle Joe. Because <laughs> whenever he got good and ready, he could just reel it in. He could just reel it right on in, you know? He even had this box called his, listen to this, his bait box, right? That he would bait the fish with. And he had lures to lure the fish. He had a different lure for different fish. And he said, see son, there's all kind of fish. First of all, you got your plain old dumbass fish. <laughs> Just old dumbass fish. You catch it, throw it back, you'll catch it again. It will bite at the same bait. Now that sounds funny till you realize that we went right back to the same spot where we just got beat at and caught from the same person. Just old dumbass fish. <laughs> he said, then you have fish that you have to be a little more inventive and creative. You know, they don't go for the same bait, right? But they'll go for the same cake with different icing, right? You put down the substance but then you use something else to make your life unmanageable, right? So you got four-wheeled drive bait, two-legged bait, right? Money, property, and prestige bait, clean time bait. There's all kind of stuff to get hooked up on in here. And that's why great care has to be taken, you understand? I was so glad to find that when I did my second step, I got the gift of the second step by continuing to come back, and that's the gift of discrimination. If you do a thorough second step, you'll get a gift, the gift of discrimination. You come in here not knowing, not knowing whether you're right or wrong, thinking you did right when you did wrong, nonsense making sense to you. But if you keep coming back and listen to the other eyes and ears in here, you get the gift of discrimination. To a point that you get to the end of the second step and your belief has grown. Coming in here hopeless, then getting some hope. Then the hope turning into belief. The belief turning into faith, the faith turning into trust. And then when you know where to really put your faith, you'll make a decision to put your faith in a loving God, to live in the care of your greatest source of strength and courage, surrendering quietly, no longer fighting the fear, anxiety, worry, and all of that. Knowing that a loving God has his arms embraced all around you, you know? And that's what gives you the strength to move on to a fourth step. And the fourth step is a very important step, you know, to take a fearless and searching moral inventory. You know, most people make the mistake of doing exactly what the step says not to do. And it says it in the step. It's the only step that tells you what the purpose of it is and what the purpose of it is not. It says the purpose of this step is not to get lost on a binge of emotional sorrow writing about what a terrible, despicable person you are. Because once again, we have a disease and not a moral deficiency. Just because you ask me to take a searching and fearless moral inventory doesn't make me automatically morally deficient. It says the purpose is to sort through the confusion and contradiction in your life. Look at your patterns, your drives, your instincts, your routine behaviors. Try to figure out where you got confused. And the reason why it's upsetting sometimes to write a fourth step is because I didn't want to look at the truth. That I would confuse Almighty God with a little plastic vial of white substance. That I could confuse Almighty God with a little glassine bag of dope. That's disturbing. Nobody wants to cop to that, to admit to that. To admit to being a heathen, worshiping false idols. Maybe it wasn't a totem pole, but it was a bag of dope. You know, running around like somebody straight out of the cave era, worshiping earth, wind, and fire. Weed, smoke, clouds, worshiping the cloud god. It's disturbing to know that you could be a grown man or a grown woman running around addicted to false idols, worshiping false idols. Because worshiping only means to give your all to something. And that's what we do in here. And that's what I did in here. So it was a real...
beautiful thing to work through my patterns, drives, and instincts. And I didn't have to write about everybody I ever slept with. That wasn't what inquiring minds wanted to know. What my sponsor wanted to know is, how did you confuse all of those women with your greatest source of strength and courage? Didn't have to talk about every job I held. How did you confuse money, property, and prestige with your greatest source of strength and courage? This is what I needed to get down to. Because every time I got separated from God, I became paralyzed by fear. Fear comes from separation from God. That's the exact nature of things I needed to get down to. So when I did a fifth step, I could talk to my sponsor about the exact nature of things. Because when I first did a fourth step, I said things like, yeah, and, and here, here's an instance in which we robbed a store. No, you didn't rob the store. That's not what you need to be talking about. You need to be talking about the fact that you were a punk. And you were separated from God. And you were so afraid that you mistook the acceptance from your so-called friends as a substitute for the acceptance you needed from God. That's what went on here. And I needed to see these things so that I could have a true understanding of my defects of character. Before we could even talk about my defects of character, I didn't have any character. Character is the ability to stick with a proposition long after the mood changes. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that because I was caught up with fear. You know, so I was just so glad to have these steps and to have the ability to understand that I need Almighty God to help me get better. To be able to go to him and humbly ask him to help me, you know. And as a paradox, when you get through six and seven, asking God to help you, the first thing God says was straighten out your affairs with others. You want me to help you help others that you've harmed. And when you finish that, continue taking, continue to take a searching and fearless moral inventory. Continue to, continue to take a personal inventory so that you can see where you are on a daily basis. You know, and the biggest thing about the 10th step is it's so vital because you can't possibly go to step 11. You can't, you can't get to 11 if you can't count to 10. You don't even have to worry about 11 if you can't count to 10. If you don't clear away all of your obsessions and compulsions, you can never truly meditate. You'll never know true prayer. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest possible point of view, you know. And when you get to 11, there's good news. I'm going to come full circle now. There's good news because I used to always wonder, what's God's will for me? Maybe somebody else is out here wondering, what's God's will for me? And it works on why it talks about what God's will is. It says we learn that we can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We've begun to see that regardless of the presence or absence of material success in our lives, we can be content. In other words, when a man has or a woman has the proper content, they'll be content. If you have a God-centered life, you'll be content with or without these other things. And then it goes on to say something. This is the language I want to share with you. We come to see that our most heartfelt longings and dreams of our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. In fact, they are the very essence of God's will for us. Now we all know about essence, that's why you cooked up drugs to get to the essence. That's why you cooked up coke to get to the essence. It's good news to know that what you in your heart of hearts want and long for, your heartfelt dreams, constitutes God's will for you. That's good news. We don't have to run around here confused anymore. The same God that brought us in here in a loving, caring manner is still guiding us today. My time is getting short, but I want to just say a few words to the newer member. Learn to get a God of your understanding. And make that your greatest source of strength and courage. On December 26th, and just for the day, it says, Now that we've stumbled into the rooms of recovery, we may be tempted to rely on another human being to meet our needs. We may expect this from our sponsor, our lover, 
or our best friend. But dependence on human beings is risky. They fall short of perfection. They may be on vacation, sleeping, or in a bad mood when we need them. Our dependence must rest on a power greater than ourselves. No human force can restore our sanity, care for our will and our lives, or be unconditionally available and loving whenever we are in need. We must place our trust in the God of our understanding, for only that power will never fail us. Older members, pay particular attention to the newcomer. Keep this fellowship vital, alive, and well. Monitor the suggestions that you give to the newer member. Don't be talking out the side of your neck to the newer member. Share with them the same pristine, pure message that you got when you came. Because sometimes people take license with the newcomer and give them suggestions that don't even make sense. Matter of fact, I've compiled a list. I call it Usman's list of dumbass suggestions. The first one is this. You sometimes hear people say, this is for me. I'm sure you've all been, meeting, been in meetings and somebody's about to share and say, I need to share, but this is just for me. How can something be for you, just for you in a WE program? How can, notwithstanding the fact we come in here with different degrees of sickness and rates of recovery, we're all the same person, and yet this is just for you? How can this be a selfless program, and this be just for you? It's a dumbass saying. Dumbass saying number two. If you just don't use, you've had a successful day. Wait. We're interested here in recovery, not simple abstinence. In other words, I can't walk down the street and hit a baby in the head with a hammer and say, hey, I ain't used. He comes to you, they're in pain. Well, this too will pass. You might need to get out of that situation. It reminds me of what my sixth grade teacher, Ida Trimaglazi, used to have this big sign on the, on the, on the wall in, in school. And the sign said, time will pass. The only question is, will you? <laughs> the first year is a gift. First year is a gift. That's not what our literature says. Our literature says we saw that from the first day we could use these steps and make them a vital part of our lives. Our literature says that after a few meetings, right before step one, as a result of attending a few meetings, we begin to feel like we finally belong somewhere. It's in these meetings that we're introduced to the 12 steps. And we work them on a daily basis. The steps are our solution, our survival kit, our defense against a deadly disease. So don't go for that old okie doke. I'm not working any steps, but the steps are working me. That's like you coming to see me and I'm very sick. I'm very sick. I'm very sick. And you say, Usman, did you go to the doctor? And I say, yes, I did. Did he, did he prescribe any medication for you? Yes, it's over there on the shelf. Are you taking it? No, I'm not taking it, but it's taking me. <laughs> Number six, my best thinking got me here. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. How can you be on the one hand being restored to sanity and your best thinking got you here? That's just like me calling home to my wife and saying, listen, I'm in jail. Why are you in jail? What did they charge you with? Drunk driving. My best driving got me here. No, your drunk driving got you here. Our drunk thinking got us here. Next, no major changes in the first year. 
you better make some major changes. <laughs> Next one. If you don't know what to do, just don't do nothing. If you don't know what to do, you better ask somebody. <laughs> Next one. Well, you see, what I do might make you get high. Well, then you better leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> the next one. You in pain? Well, look. Just, just do it till it hurts. I don't know what to tell you. Just, child, just do it till it hurts. That's a terrible thing to tell an addict. That's a terrible thing to tell somebody who has for years practiced pressing down emotions, practiced anesthetizing themselves to the point where they may not even, it, it's going to take them years to feel anything. You can't tell, you ever hear the word OD? People who OD don't feel anything. That's a terrible thing to tell somebody to do it till it hurts. Terrible thing. God won't put on you more than you can handle. No, God won't put more on you than you and God can handle. You better use your greatest source of strength and courage. And here's one that always gets me. You're as sick as your secrets. Whatever's going on with you, just come on in here and drop it. Get it off of you. Come to the meeting and drop it. As if you never heard a telephone, telegraph, tell an addict. And of the three, tell an addict is the quickest form of communication. <laughs> On page 250, and just for the day, it says, the fifth step, I said the fifth step, ask us to, ch to share our true nature with God, ourselves, and another human being. It doesn't encourage us to tell everyone every little secret about ourselves. It doesn't ask us to disclose to the whole wide world every shameful or frightening thought we've ever had. Just for today I can disarm the secrets in my life by sharing them with one human being. If you know you're going into a room full of people who have character defects what on earth would possess you to think that you could share your most deepest secret with them and that all of them collectively are just going to keep it to themselves? And finally, it begins and ends with me. No, that's not true. It begins with God. This is a God-given program. In the 12th step, it says we received our recovery as a gift from the God of our understanding. And when you work these steps, they will take you right back to God. To a point where all you'll want is more knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. You know, if you're newer than me, stick and stay. Welcome to Attic Heaven. You're now standing up out of hell. This is as good as it gets. You're safe. You're home. You're free. Enjoy this newfound freedom. Be happy to be here. Work your steps. Use your sponsor. Go to meetings. Regardless of how you feel and regardless of what you think. Because sometimes in life, there are going to be days when you don't feel like recovery. There are going to be days when you don't think it's working for you. But that's all right because God is still on the job. In order to release the hidden splendor in a diamond, you first have to put it under intense pressure. Pressure makes diamonds out of coal. And then you have to give it to a master gemologist so he can cut it just right. So even though you might sometimes be experiencing pain, just think of it as God has cutting me up to release the hidden splendor in me. And finally, 
what God has done, God can do. And if he can lift me up, he can lift up you. If I've said anything that sounded beautiful, spiritual, uplifting, credit it to the God of my understanding. If I said anything to offend you or that sounded off color, credit it to me. I'm an addict. My name is Usman. Thanks for listening.